Hi, today we're going to be going over A2 of this year's Putnam. Now I actually sat this Putnam and I was able to do this problem during the exam. So this video is going to be more of a walkthrough of how I arrived at my solution. So the question states, let n be a even positive integer and pn be a polynomial of degree 2n that's monic such that this peculiar identity is satisfied. p of 1 over k is k squared for for k in this set. It's minus 1 all the way up to minus n and then 1 and then the, all the way up to n. These For these two n numbers this identity is satisfied. The problem then asks to find all other real numbers x such that the same identity is satisfied. If you wish to give the problem a try yourself please pause the video and do so now. Now that I hope you've given the problem a try, here's how I did the problem. So initially I thought of Lagrange interpolation because we're given a polynomial of degree 2n and we're given its evaluation at 2n points. Now this is not enough to completely characterize any polynomial of degree 2n but uh, I think if I were to write p of x minus x to the 2n, so this part of the polynomial, and if I were to set that as g of x, now you can do Lagrange interpolation because I know the evaluation of this polynomial at 2n points. Right? I know that g of 1 over k is k squared minus 1 over k to the 2n for these same k. So I can actually do Lagrange interpolation and I can exactly find what g is. And then I can equivalently solve for p of 1 over x equals x squared because I can know exactly what p of x is, right? p of x is just g of x plus x to the 2n. However, if you, uh, if you try to do the Lagrange interpolation, so you would write g of x is equal to, okay, there's a sum, then there's a product over uh, j not equal to i, you have xi minus xj, or sorry, here it's x minus xj, and then you have xi minus xj, and then you have the value at that point, so I guess that would be k squared, and then you would say, okay, uh, this happens for um, i going from 1 to, well, k in this set. Although I think uh, then you'd have to say x xj would, would be some way of ordering the set. I think if you try to write this out, it's already going to get quite complicated, and I realized this, and given that this is a Putnam problem and an A2 problem, I don't think a bashy solution that's going to be messy like this is the best way to approach these things. But then what else do we do? Well, at this time, I uh, remembered a problem that I had done before. The problem will be up on the screen, but it was something like p of k is k over k plus 1 for uh, n plus 1 values, and um, p was a degree n polynomial sort of something similar and the problem asked what is the value of p of n plus 1. Now I know it doesn't look the same but the approach here was to rewrite this as saying p of x is equal to x over x plus 1 for n for uh, n values, sorry this should be just n, and to, to then say the polynomial x plus 1 p of x minus x which I'll call g of x, to then say I have, uh, I have n plus 1 roots of this polynomial. So you know, I rewrite this identity as as this, and then I set that as a polynomial, and I can be like, okay, g of x, I can factor it as some alpha times, you know, x times x minus 1 times blah, blah, all the way up to x minus n, and that's how we did the problem. I remembered that, okay, this, this is a problem I've done before, and this kind of looks similar, except this time I have p of 1 over k is equal to k squared. But uh, I realized, okay, I can, make, I can make it similar to the problem I've done before if I just say, okay, let k be 1 over m, then I have p of m is 1 over m squared for m in this sort of modified set. It's just minus 1 over n, minus 1, 1, 1 over n. I've written the exact same statement. I just rewrote it in a way where I can now say, okay, this, this I can rewrite as m squared p of m minus 1 is equal to 0. And so if I were to set my polynomial g of x to be x squared p of x minus 1, I, I already have two n zeros of this polynomial. Now that's a lot of zeros, and this is looking good. I can maybe factor something. So firstly, p of x is degree 2n. x squared times that is degree 2n plus 2. So okay, g of x is a degree 2n plus 2 polynomial. Um, I know 
2n of its roots, the other two, let me call them r1 and r2, so I can write it as, you know, alpha times x minus r1 times x minus r2 times, you know, x minus 1 and x plus 1 and blah blah, x minus 1 over n times x plus 1 over n. I can write it like this. One thing to note is that because p of x is given as monic in the problem, x squared p of x is also, you know, monic, and so g of x is actually monic. So that means that I can just uh, I can just forget about this alpha. This alpha is actually just one. Okay, that's one good news. The other thing is that g of zero is uh, you know it's zero squared times whatever minus one, which is just going to be minus one. But according to this formula, g of zero would be you know minus r one times minus r two times minus one times one times blah blah all the way up to minus one over n times one over n. And this is now equal to minus 1. Now, a good thing that we had in the condition was that n is even. So, you know, these minus signs, they sort of cancel out. There's n minus signs here. They cancel out. Uh, these minus signs cancel out as well. So we have r1 times r2 times. Now we have 1 over 1 times 1 over 1 times 1 over 2 times 1 over 2 times 1 and, you know, so on and so forth times 1 over n times 1 over n is equal to minus 1. This, this term is just 1 over n factorial squared. So we know that r1, r2 is minus n factorial squared. Okay, so we know the product of the roots. That's good. Oh wait, why do I even care about the roots? Well, because this condition, right, p of m equals 1 over m squared is, uh, is equivalent to m being a root of g. And, well, if you have that p of m equals 1 over m squared, then, you know, m must be like 1 over r for some r. And then that's just saying p of... 1 over r, which is m, is 1 over m squared, which is r squared. So actually, it's equivalent. Our problem is equivalent to just finding the reciprocals of the roots of g. So, okay, it's a good idea to find the roots of g. So far, we found the product, and uh, at this point, uh, I was like, okay, we're very, very, very close. But this, this is the part that got me a bit stuck. Uh, you know, all we used so far was that this was x, this was some power of x times p of x here. I didn't use that this was x squared p of x yet. Uh, I can use that by, you know, setting g prime of, uh, like, finding what g prime of x is and then seeing that, okay, g prime of 0 should also be something like 0. And then maybe from there I can find the sum of the roots or something. But instead, I, I realized, okay, the smallest power of x in x squared p of x is, is x squared, right? And when I do a minus 1, Th that just changes the constant term. So there's actually no coefficient of x in g of x because just by looking at this, there's no coefficient of x in g of x. Now that's good because uh, what do we know about coefficients of x? Well, we know if you have a polynomial x minus r1, x minus r2, all up to x minus rn, this is some polynomial, we know that it's coefficient of x. Well, that means that you have to choose x from exactly one bracket and then the roots from all the others. Uh, okay, so I can rewrite that as saying, okay, the sum over all uh, minus 1 times minus 1, well, that happens uh, at minus 1 to the n minus 1 times, and then there will be a product of the roots. There will be a product of the roots excluding some terms. So let's just say j not equal to i of uh, rj, and then this these uh, range from 1 to n. This is now the coefficient of x, and what we have is in our case this coefficient is zero now whether or not this is simple to calculate let's find out but you know I, it took me a while to come at this and you know when I did when I did notice this I kind of jumped out of my chair because I realized one one very nice thing about the way the roots are set up so let's just write our roots again our roots are x minus r1 x minus you know r2 and then there's x minus 1 x plus 1 it's minus 1 over 2 x plus 1 over 2 then it goes all the way up to x minus 1 over n, x plus 1 over n. And I realized something nice is that when I try to write this product out, right? So, well, firstly, I can just ignore this minus 1 to the n minus 1 sign. And let's say I look at the first term. And the first term, r1 is gone. Okay, so that's, you know, r2, and then there's, there's 1, there's minus 1, there's blah, blah, all the way up to 1 over n and minus 1 over n. The second term, r1 is missing. Okay. Or, sorry, the second term, r2 is missing. So, okay, there's a sum. And there's the same term. Let me call this term, uh, I don't know, c, r1c. Okay, now the third term, r1 and r2 are both there. Okay, but uh, this time minus 1 is missing. Minus 1 is missing, but there's a 1. Okay, 
there's one and then there's the exact same terms that we have here it's just that there's a minus one missing and that that means that we have a minus c okay and now the next term this is where it gets interesting now there's a this plus one missing but we have this minus one term so what do we actually have we we have exactly what c would be right we have this exact same product because this time only the only the one is missing and one missing you know doesn't change anything one one time something is the same thing so there's r1 r2 plus c okay uh, let's look at the next one uh, there's a this one has a minus one over two missing okay so I have you know I have this one I have this minus one I have this also but I don't have minus one over two so okay I still have r1 r2 and then I have let's say minus two times c okay let's look at the next one next one I have r1 r2 I have you know again I have one I have minus one I have minus one over two but I don't have one over two uh, and then I have the same thing. Well, if I don't have one over two, that's just two times c. And you know, I go, I keep going on like this. Do you notice something? I notice that I notice now that I can actually cancel these terms, right? It's minus something plus the same thing, minus something plus the same thing. And if I keep doing this all the way up to n, I would have, uh, you know, for this term, I'd have r1, r2, and I'd have minus n c. And then if I have this one, it's r1, r2, plus n c, and that's again going to cancel out. So in fact, the the sum that we're left with is you know r two times c plus r one times c is zero, or in other words, r two plus r one is zero. So r one is actually the negative of r two, and because we already know that r one r two is minus n factorial squared, that tells us that you know minus r one squared is minus n factorial squared, and thus r one is plus or minus n factorial. If r1 is plus n factorial, r2 is minus n factorial, and vice versa. So we actually have that the set of roots r1, r2 is n factorial minus n factorial. But then we're done because we said that you know the p of x such that uh, it's uh, such that p of one over x is x squared. That's just the reciprocal of these roots. So the other two x such that this happens is just it's one over n factorial and minus one over n factorial, and we're done with our problem. That was it. Now, I can actually summarize this problem quite fast. I, I can. All I need to say is, okay, let g of x be x squared p of x minus 1. Note that g of 0 is equal to minus 1. Hence, the product of the roots is minus n factorial squared. Note that g of x has no x coefficient. Hence, this alternating sum with this one term being left off is going to be 0. Notice that that's just going to be r1 times c plus r2 times c. And that gives you the r1 and r2 are you know negatives of each other, and there you can find the roots, and you're done because you know that being a root of g corresponds to being a reciprocal of x such that your identity is satisfied. That's it. That's the problem. It's very short. However, I guess you needed this insight of transforming it into a problem like this, and then setting g to be a polynomial, and you know factoring it like this. But this is a fairly standard trick, I guess, with these problems. If you've seen the problem that I mentioned, this one. Uh, if you've seen this problem, then, you know, I think it's a fairly standard trick to uh, do this thing. So, yeah, I would, I would credit being able to solve this problem to doing a problem that was similar and then reducing it to something that can be solved in the same way. That's why when people give you the advice, you know, when you ask them, how do I, how do I get better at math? How do I get better at problem solving? And they give you the advice, just do more math, do more problems. Although it sounds very unhelpful, it's the most helpful thing one can say because... Yeah, just do more math, do more problems, and eventually you'll realize a lot of problems can be reduced or solved in the same way other problems can be solved. So yeah, that was A2 of this year's Putnam. I would say it's not that hard. In fact, I would I would say that it's, uh, you know, maybe this is like A1 difficulty, but it was still nonetheless a very fun problem. And uh, I think if you have done a similar problem like this, then I think it's I think you'll be able to do this problem quite quickly. I had a few friends who who did not notice this. So some people tried Lagrange interpolation and didn't get anywhere. Some people um, didn't notice the fact that there's a zero x coefficient here. So then they did Lagrange interpolation and proved that g of x was even to conclude that r1 and r2 are negatives. But yeah, I think all the all of that annoying calculation can be avoided by just you know basic uh, polynomial knowledge.